people, and it's not easy to lose weight. And the reason why we're, we think that we're so successful in having people permanently lose weight, because they're not focused on trying to cut back on calories or do heavy exercise. They're focused on trying to eat a diet that's nutrient rich and nutrient diverse. Welcome to Sugar Free TV. And uh, we are so uh, happy today to have our amazing guest, Dr. Furman, uh, and, uh, and joining us from the U U United States. Dr. Furman, welcome to Sugar Free TV. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, excited to be here. Fantastic, fantastic. So, um, so yeah, a little bit of an intro uh, to what we're doing in this in this uh, talk. Really, is to have we we're inviting guests from diverse uh, backgrounds uh, to come and have a discussion with us about the issues of sugar in our diets and what that sugar is doing uh, to our health. And you particularly specialize in gut health. So tell us a little bit about your background and what you do and your speciality. And, and yeah, we're so fascinated and so grateful to have you here. Thank you. Well, I'm a board certified family physician and I'm a seven times New York Times bestselling author. And I've been involved with the field of nutritional medicine and nutritional research for more than 30 years. Published, I've written 12 books and, and numerous research articles, but my real specialty is aiding people to reverse serious chronic diseases so, so people can get rid of their diabetes and be normal. I, I, my mantra is do not treat your diabetes, get rid of it. So we, we want people to get rid of their high blood pressure, get rid of their heart attack. And I've had thousands of people that reversed autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, connective tissue disorder, psoriasis, and lupus. I was mentioning, I even had a, a girl who was 16 years old on the national renal transplant list waiting for a new kidney with a creatinine of 4.2, which means 95% of her kidney is shot. She's got no kidney function left. And she got well and her kidney function came totally back to normal. Her creatinine went from 4.2 to 0.8. Just giving one example. So I have many hundreds, if not thousands of people, and I have 500 of such disease reversal cases on my website at drfurman.com. So my works and my um, passion is telling people they don't have to be sick and nutritional excellence not only extends human lifespan and enables us to prevent against cancer, heart attacks, strokes, and dementia, but also the most therapeutically advanced diet, the most longevity promoting diet can also work therapeutically to help people get well from serious illnesses. So that's my specialty and that's my passion. And I've been um, working in this field and, and in San Diego in the United States, I actually have a, a retreat center open all year round where people who are let's food addiction, have obesity and other comorbidities can come and stay here a few months. Some people stay two months, three months or six months to lose their weight and to get off their medications and to get well again and to be set and to be sent back home with the knowledge and the and the skills to do it and enjoy eating healthfully, making the recipes, you know, eating you know a lot of vegetables and beans and nuts and fruits and and being able to eat a healthy natural food diet. So I do advocate um, organically grown natural foods, regenerative organic agriculture. We grow our own fruits and vegetables here. And we teach people how to grow sprouts and microgreens and how to make vegetables taste really good with the Thai curry sauce. And we have, and I have a, I have products like, um, you know, to special types of tomato sauce with no salt and sugar in it, or a, or a, or a salad dressing made with nuts and seeds and no salt, oil, or sugar in it. And I have, you know, I have different types of products that, um, you know, like a raw granola made with no sugar or salt or oil. It's, that's not even cooked. It's just made in a dehydrator to make it more crispy. So we have all kinds of things that we make. We have it make it easy for people to follow this, quote, nutritarian diet. So the word I coined is called nutritarian, which means picking the foods that extend human lifespan and offer the most protection against cancer and, and utilizing them in a dietary portfolio and avoiding those foods that shorten lifespan or, you know, or increase the risk of chronic disease. Amazing. Fantastic. Amazing. Uh, does, that sounds to me that you, uh, are you a very much a proponent of a plant-based diet? So tell us a little bit more about that. I absolutely am because it's the, you could say people realize, and I'm sure your listeners know, 
that as sugar spikes in the bloodstream, it raises, the glucose raises and your body produces an excess amount of insulin. Now, fat on the body makes you insulin resistant. The more overweight you are, the more insulin that needs to be produced. And insulin promotes angiogenesis. It allows cellular replication. It allows cancer cells to replicate. And it's immunosuppressive. It prevents the immune system from attacking abnormal cells and removing them. But while insulin is doing that, animal protein, especially in excess, raises insulin-like growth factor one, another hormone that promotes cellular replication and angiogenesis. And the high levels of insulin in conjunction with a more animal protein gives you this IGF-1 insulin sandwich. So pizza, macaroni and cheese, burgers, you know, ham sandwiches, these things which mix animal protein and carbohydrate are the most dangerous foods because you're spiking up both insulin and IGF-1 and both animal products and processed carbohydrates have no significant micronutrient load. I'm saying that food gives us macronutrients, fat, carbohydrate, and protein. And the, in the modern Western world, United States and Europe, people are eating excessive amounts of macronutrients, of calories that shorten their lifespan, but they're ubiquitously deficient in micronutrients the vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals and antioxidants that are found in colorful foods. So I'm saying a, chick, a piece of chicken is like a bagel. And the reasons a chicken is like a bagel because they both can push up hormones unfavorably, but mostly because they're both examples of foods with a low micronutrient load. They don't have a significant load of micronutrients and they don't contain phytochemicals and antioxidants that protect against cancer. A matter of fact, the six foods with the most proven scientific evidence to protect against cancer and support immune function, those six foods are represented by my acronym, G-BOMBS, G-B-O-M-B-S, which stands for greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds. So we want people to have a huge variety of natural plants, and if they, and if they, they can do that on a plant-based or vegan diet, or they can use animal products in small amounts like a condiment, but we're not recommending people eat large amounts of animal products because that puts hormones into an unfavorable state and allow cancer cells to replicate and, a and ages you faster because you shouldn't have so much growth hormone activity going on as you age because we're not growing anymore and things are going to be growing on your body that should not be growing. Interesting. That's fascinating. So uh, we probably are mixing in very much the, the, the same circles, actually. This is very, very interesting. Oh, my goodness. I could see Luke smiling away over there. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, very interesting. And it, it's, it's interesting to hear what you're saying in terms of, uh, as you know, something I didn't know. And that was the, the you know, having things growing on your body. And, and I hadn't even considered that concept. So that's a, that's Maybe. yeah. You're feeding things that are then growing and then you, yeah, that's not what you want. And also both sugar and animal protein, the same thing that pushes up those unfavorable hormones, yeah. pushes the bacterial growth in the gut that produces TMAO or trimethylamine oxide. So it's both the high amount of animal protein and sugar that promotes these inflammatory compounds that irritate the endothelial lining of blood vessels and increase the risk of heart attack, death, and TMAO is also promotes cancer too, you know, as well, but we're, we get more inflammatory compounds. Whereas when you eat mushrooms and beans and green vegetables, and I'm saying these four foods produce the most favored microbiome that thicken the biofilm that cover the villi. And the four foods we're talking about are two raw foods, meaning raw green vegetables, and raw onion and scallion or green onion, those like the, the um, allium family. And the two cooked foods we're talking about are cooked beans and cooked mushrooms. So when you have a high content of those foods, it scientists call it the second meal effect because the microbiome now that is thickened and adherent to the villi in the small intestine slows the absorption of glucose. When you, so when you had that mango with some oatmeal in the morning, the glucose into the bloodstream is blunted and slowed because you're regularly a consumer of beans and onions and mushrooms and your microbiome is more favorable. So we're talking here about a lot of factors because we're using this term insulin resistance 
to say that a measurement of insulin resistance is a good predictor of longevity. It's a good predictor of how long you're gonna live. So the combination between eating a diet that's glycemically unfavorable, as well as having extra body fat on the body work together to make you more insulin resistant and then accelerates the aging process. Whereas the opposite is true. If we, if we undershoot our calories by a little bit, we not only keep our body fat low, so I'm recommending that males keep their body fat below 15% and females need to keep their body fats below 25% because if they don't, they start to develop more insulin resistance and also, frankly, more estrogen production from fat cells. And, more, and the fat cells also spew out pro-inflammatory compounds that interfere with immune function and like cytokines and lipokines, and, and the body can't actively um, gene silence those areas of DNA that might be impaired or not normal. And, the, and also the surge of sugar in the bloodstream from eating sweets also impairs gene silencing. So what I'm saying right now is that the body has the ability to shut down genes that could be dangerous or disease causing. If you have a cancer causing gene, like the BRCA1 gene or the GSTP1 gene, the body can silence that gene with enough intake of green vegetables, let's say. But, but as you eat sweets and sugars and things like that, and, and as you spike sugar in your bloodstream with insulin resistance, then the body loses the ability to silence abnormal genes and then the abnormal genes are able to express themselves and cause disease. We all have our genetic weaknesses, but those weaknesses don't cause disease when we're living in a very healthful manner. They only cause disease when we live in an unhealthful manner. Absolutely, absolutely. It's fascinating, isn't it? So um, I, I, I also come from a healthcare background, Dr. Fuhrman, and, and I've observed in my clinical practice kind of, you know, over the last sort of uh, 15, 20 years of just observing the female population coming through uh, you know, and uh, I remember at some of our clinics, what we used to, we used to sort of comment that we would be in the minority, we'd kind of celebrate when we had someone coming through in recent years of a normal BMI, whereas it used to be the other way around, but actually it was, it was, it was not the norm to, to have, you know, to sort of be booking women for pregnancy care, um, you know, that were 30 BMI or above, you know, whereas it sort of it started in, in within, uh, particularly in London, started to become almost like a normal thing then to have to kind of book them in for high risk care, uh, yeah. essentially, when they should have been young fit women that could have, you know, had. So what do you say about the, you know, the diet, the kind of dietary habits that people are developing um, um, that you've seen over the, the in your career, uh, particularly with the amount of high sugar that people are eating. What, what, what would you think about this? Well, I don't consider that those things food, they're drugs and they act on the brain like an addictive drug. And don't forget, I'm saying that white flour is a sugar equivalent. There's no biochemical difference in eating a pizza, bagel, croissant, Italian bread, you know, hamburger roll and eating straight sugar cube right from the jar because it still enters the bloodstream as sugar and white flour products are almost as high glycemic as straight sugar, honey, and maple syrup are. So we, you know, as you know, sugar is a combination of sucrose and fructose and honey might have more fructose and maple syrup might have more sucrose and aguave and coconut sugar has more fructose and less, but it doesn't matter. They all raise triglycerides. They all interfere with liver function. They all stop. They're all addictive to the brain because the, they stimulate dopamine cent centers in the brain and they don't act like a food because the word food means it supplies the, bur the body with nourishment for cells to function normally. And here we're putting energy into the body and the body can't convert calories from sugar into energy production without cofactors of vitamins and minerals. So the mitochondria can't utilize it well. So it more shunts it to fat storage. And when you do make the little energy you can make from it, it's utilizing your nutrient reserves, making you more depleted and feeling fatigued. So you, so you get a little bit of temporary energy and then it leads you feeling full, more fatigued and it leads to the accumulation of intramyocellular lipid stores so it increases triglyceride production. And it of course leads to more muscle um, impregnated with fat, like the marbling of the muscle, which then makes people lethargic and not feel like doing anything and inactive and it leads to obesity. But, but I was also suggesting that the spike of sugar in the bloodstream from these high glycemic carbohydrates 
also are addictive to the dopaminergic centers in the brain in the same areas where opiates stimulate and you develop dopamine intolerance or you develop more tolerance for it. So now you don't get the same high anymore. You need more calories and you need more calories just to feel okay. So people aren't satisfied with a normal amount of calories. They don't feel right unless they overeat calories now. So they, you know, I always say half of what we eat feeds our needs and the other half feeds the needs of our doctors. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's, it sounds like a joke, but it's really true that, the, that in, in the United States, the average calorie consumption is 3,400 calories a day, where in rural China, it's 1,600 calories a day. And we're eating approximately double the calories we require. And people aren't satisfied with 1,400, 1,500, 1,600, 1,700 calories a day. They, because they're, not, they're nutrient deprived, they're fiber deprived, they don't have the right degree of microbiome. They, they feel like they can't, they, they're wiped out. They feel wiped unless they keep putting food in because the minute they stop overeating, they start to go through into a detoxification process and they start to go through withdrawal just as if they were stopping heroin or cocaine. And they get fatigued and headache and shakes and hangry, which is an anxiety induced low sugar. So it's not the low blood sugar that causes the problem. It's all the biochemical events of detoxification withdrawal that accompany the low blood sugar going down. We should feel fine with our low blood sugar being at baseline. A matter of fact, when you're, you live more, you live in the catabolic phase, when you're not digesting, when your sugar goes to the baseline, that's when the body is healing most effectively and repairing and, re, and, re, and repairing and, and conserving energy. We're not supposed to be eating and feeding our body all, all day and all night. So it's, it's a little bit complicated. I know I was speaking a little bit quickly, but I know we, you know, I wanted to give people the overview that this is more, this is a seriously addictive sum, substance and white flower products that are so prevalent in the modern world are not food, they're a drug. And they don't, they're not associated with lifespan, they're associated with shortening of human lifespan and increasing risk of chronic disease, including dementia in later life. And they're also linked to depression, that both sugar and commercial baked goods are, make you lose brain cells and also cause abnormal neurohormonal connection between the synapses of cells in the brain and increase a person's risk of depression. So much so that even two servings a week of commercial baked goods or fast food doubles your lifetime risk of depression, but it happens in a, in a dose dependent manner. And you know, people will say to me, well, that's two servings a week, but most people in America eat 20 servings a week, you know, 30 servings a week, they're eating, how come they're all not depressed? And I'm saying, well, they are actually, they're dysthymic because it makes them lose their passion and happiness quotient. And they just live to be, they just live for their addictive sensation. They work a job. They're not so depressed. They can't get out of bed, but they're somewhat dysthymic from their poor nutrition, which means they're not excited about the world around them. They're living in their narcissistic bubble because when you're an addict, the world is you. You don't really have um, excitement and feelings and emotions for the outside world, for the beauty of the world around you. You don't emote and relate to people as much and care about others as much as, as much as you care about meeting your own selfish need to meet your need for addictive substance to stimulate the dopamine centers in your brain. So the, the more you're an addict, the more you're involved in your own um, personal stimulation of brain cells, and you become less of the person you were meant to be and more involved with your own. So, you, so it does affect people's propensity for anger, their lack of ability to think logically, their lack of creativity, and their lack of having, looking forward to waking up every day with passion, excitement, and being and, 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 an unlevel, and a natural level of happiness. So it does affect people's outlook in life tremendously for this, this, um, these modern diets that are deficient in nutrients. Yeah, and do you it's, think, it's you know, I was going to ask, is there, do you think there's a, a, a link that between some of the companies that are promoting things like more exercise to enable us to uh, consume more sugary foods? And what's your sort of view on the way that, you know, we can just simply, some of the companies say, we just simply run those calories off. What, what's your view on that kind of message? Well, you know, it doesn't really work, you know, people, and it's not easy to lose weight. And the reason why we're, we think that we're so successful in having people permanently lose weight because they're not focused on trying to cut back on calories or do heavy exercise. They're focused on trying to eat a diet that's nutrient rich and nutrient diverse. By eating enough, are you eating a big salad every day? 
You know, are you eating a large salad as a main dish? Are you having vegetable bean soup? Are you having serving of cooked green vegetables? Are you having the cooked mushrooms and onions? Are you eating at least a cup of beans a day? Are you eating three fresh fruits a day? Are you eating at least an ounce and a half to two ounces of nuts, of raw nuts and seeds a day? In other words, once you start eating the nature's bounty and you get a huge variety of these nutrients, it naturally suppresses your appetite. So the sugar diet makes keeps your appetite abnormally large and the need to constantly consume excess calories. And then as you add exercise onto that, then it just makes you want to consume even more calories. And the more calories you throw through your body, the faster you're aging yourself. You know, you can overexercise too. We want to people to be able to exercise regularly, but not to, you know, but being a professional athlete requiring 4,000 calories a day is not conducive to a longer lifespan. It's, you know, and I, by the way, I was an athlete in my, in my early life. I was on the world team in figure skating. Oh, wow. I was, um, I was second in the United States in 1973 in pair figure skating, and I was on the world team. and And I was in, you know, London and all around Europe. I was in um, in ice shows and com competitions, and I traveled all over the place. Um, you know, but of course, that degree of training and that degree of competitive athleticism is not good for your long term health. It's like over exercising and you're overly consumed and with your narrow focus on training all day long. And it's that also was not a very healthy way to live, you know. Yeah, well, uh, interesting, interesting that um, that you mentioned as well, um, you know, the, this kind of high carbohydrate rich diets and uh, I call it a carb coma. <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah. you you consume the white stuff and then then you right. just you, you know you get this and then you just you need a nap i mean you just need a siesta right it's not good i you know i very rarely consume the white carbohydrate it's very and rare people very want rare. that they want they can't stop eating it it's so addicting so and they you walk in an airport and you smell the cookies and the bagels and the pretzels and it's just what people want to eat right the croissants and the scones and all these little things and the and the fried french fried potatoes and the what and the chips and all the all the processed carbohydrate junk that kills people and they eat food knowing it's going to kill them and even though they know it's so bad for them they can't stop doing it because this food is so highly addictive yes. It is, it is, it is. And what do you think about the amount of sugar that we're feeding children? Well, I think that, it, that when the parent has cognitive dissonance, which means that when you're a food addict, you block from your thoughts the idea of how harmful it is. Like a person smoking, they block from their thoughts how dangerous smoking is. So they could get their kid a cigarette smoke. They could put the cigarette in the kid's mouth. It's like the fact that the parents, it's funny because of my four children, um, never could figure they could figure out the attractive nature of why people wanted to eat unhealthy food but they can never figure out why parents wanted to give their children unhealthy food but, you know if you know what's unhealthy why are parents giving it to their kids i can see why kids people want it because it tastes so good but why would the parents want to give them it's because they're such addicts themselves that they they don't even, they blocked from their central thought the fact that these things are disease causing and lifespan shortening you know they love their children they don't and they'll give them donuts and things you know what? And so, and they think that, so, and they've been socialized to believe that this is the normal. It's the normal way we live life to live for um, taste sensations to meet the bliss point, to get our bliss from the high sugary substances. But they don't realize that as you go to that degree of taste bliss, all you're doing is deadening your taste buds' ability to taste sweet. And now a strawberry doesn't taste sweet to you anymore. And lettuce doesn't have a vanilla sweetness to it. And avocados and cashew nuts don't taste good anymore. And now the only thing that tastes good is over is highly palatable food that's made by man-made by food scientists that's that's made to entice the so you've lost your ability to even taste normally because parents start their kids and, and it starts out with, you know, parents see their kid as like the kid like rejects food because they don't eat when they're not hungry. They push everything away. The parent doesn't like the child, looks too thin in the parent's eyes. They wanted the parents, the kid to gain weight, you know, and be like the big Pillsbury dough baby. So they try to, they got to, they can't give the baby like mango and oats and sweet potato and, and string beans and broccoli and asparagus and beans they, and nuts. They got to give the kid something that's going to make them eat when they're not hungry. That has to be a higher bliss point with more sugar and oil and salt and more uh, artificial flavor to make the kid want to eat. And then you turn the kid into an addict and then they don't want to eat natural, natural food anymore. They just want to eat fake food with a higher bliss point. 
And so uh, there, it's this, the, that's the where we start on the whole yes. vicious cycle, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. It's uh, it's incredible. I mean, you must. How popular are you in the United States? Because it sounds to me that you're not uh, towing the line over there. <laughs> Right, right. Amongst your colleagues and uh, and your peers. Well, don't forget that we've, you know, when I first started out like 35, 40 years ago, we started the American College of Lifestyle Medicine with about 10 people. And then we went to a conference with maybe 20 people at a conference. But now there's thousands of doctors who are part of these groups and learning from me. So I'm proud of the fact that I encouraged a lot of physicians and health professionals to utilize nutrition in their practices and on their, you know, on their in their skill set and in their toolbox. So, but there's much more today than ever before. But you're right. There's a a growing amount of unhealthy people too. Even though there's a growing amount of knowledgeable, healthier people, there's still a larger amount of unhealthy people at the same time. So we yeah. haven't made such a big inroad. But there's I have more camaraderie with a lot, with a lot of doctors and they're getting like you know what I mean. I speak at medical conferences. I teach doctors and they give me awards and applause, you know, so they learn. But you know that most people listening there say this sounds really good, but it's not for me because I'm not ready to change my diet and I'm not giving up the food I like. And it's, you know, it's always good for somebody else. And I'm too, you know, I'm too far gone. I'm too old. I'm too addicted. I have what I'm, you know, I'm too, my job won't let me do it. My wife won't eat this way. Because well, people come up with all these excuses because that's the way the addictive mind works. The primitive brain wants to protect your the anxiety from losing an addictive substance. So you come up with excuses to make it okay to continue your, your unhealthy habits. So we, that's why we take people, we, we have enforced abstinence. You know, I have coaching programs and online events, and I have a retreat where people come to, and we try to get people out of that addictive cycle. And you'd be surprised at how once they get away from those, that addictive eating patterns, they actually like eating natural foods more and they like the taste of this diet as much or more than their old diet. They're satisfied with a normal amount of calories and they feel, and they lose that brain fog. They can concentrate better. They become more at peace with themselves and happier. They're able to relate to other people better. And so we see that that, that really has profound benefits to, you could say, the radical shift in nutrition I'm asking people to make. Yeah, and uh, and what about the pharmaceutical companies? What do you think about what's going on there? I mean, I I certainly noticed that uh, um, you know with medicating with uh, metformin rather than giving the dietary advice, it's so much easier, isn't it, for some 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 physicians to be giving out medications rather than giving advice or or following right. the nutritional plan. So, are you seeing a shift away from that in the U.S. or? Not as a whole, but in a small number, in a small percentage of doctors, yes. But as a whole, doctors function as enablers. They give people drugs so it looks like they're okay with their sugars being lower, with their cholesterol being lower, with their even their weight may go a little lower. Their, their um, whatever it is they're giving you a drug for you, but the, the drug makes it seem like okay. I don't have to change my diet. I don't have to lose weight. I can just take the drug and continue the way I'm living. And inevitably, that makes the disease continue to progress. Your your otherwise chronic illness is worsening. So we know that people that more people have medical visits, the more they take drugs to control their diabetes, the more it accelerates progression of their diabetes and leads to more morbidity and mortality. And medical care is a major factor leading to shortened lifespan in the modern world. So mostly, what doctors do is harmful because they're using medications and not advocating people make a change in their lifestyle and without removal of cause you're not going to stop the progression of, of early life death. And, you know, over the last, you could say 50 years, we're not seeing an enhancement in lifespan in the modern world. People are still dying of number one cause of death in adults is still heart attacks and strokes. And we haven't won the war in cancer yet. We have the knowledge and the science where we can win the war against those diseases. If we apply nutritional excellence and educate our population, starting in the school system with children, and we educate them about how nutrition can affect heart attacks, strokes, cancers, dementia, and, you know, and, and give people the ability to control their health destiny. If that was major mainstream education, we would save billions of lives. You know, so almost everybody's dying of these diseases of nutritional ignorance and the medical profession contributes to it. It doesn't don't, you know, so it's it's unfortunate. But, you know, there's um, a growing number, a growing interest, but it's still, a, you know, I had a television, I had PBS public television TV shows in the United States 
which had millions of viewers and been shown on TV, you know, and I've, I've been, I've had sold millions of books. So a lot of people are that I've, and there are other doctors who've done, have done similar things. So, I mean, there are, so a lot of people are aware, aware of this way of thinking, but um, all you can do is your best, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. There, there's certainly a gap between the knowledge and the implementation. Yes, definitely. Yeah. 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 Well, Luke, I can see you nodding your head. <laughs> yeah. Very, 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 yeah. Very interesting and very, very useful to the, yeah, to everybody that's interested in get, c coming onto the Sugar Free TV and, and actually wanting the insights because you've shared a lot with us and uh, things that I didn't know and I think is so valuable. Um, and yeah, it will be to our viewers for sure. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the things that we're really passionate about is campaigning that there should be no sugar in schools. What do you think about that? Because we are, I mean, in, in the United Kingdom, there's been a big shift towards trying to look and taking, uh, you know, a, a deeper and harder look at the nutrition um, on a plate and, you know, offered at, at school dinners and, and, and meals at school. But, um, you know, we, we, are, we are still seeing a lot of sugary food fed to children right. and, you know, even in the form of juices, et cetera. Uh, right. But, you know, white sugar as part of... of and know, white flour. Well, there shouldn't be flour. any white flour, white sugar and salted foods because it's our lifetime exposure to salt that increases cardiovascular death. It's our lifetime exposure to high glycemic carbohydrate that increase the breast cancer at, you know, 85%. The highest glycemic diets have the highest rates of breast cancer, colon cancer, and prostate cancer as well. So we're talking here about um, mutilating our children with the food. And, and in our in my hometown in New Jersey, where I'm now living in California, but they wouldn't let parents bring in cupcakes and, and, and birthday gifts and birthday party foods to the school anymore. And what I'm saying, even honey and maple syrup and bagels and white flour and are all grouped in that, or are all sugar. They're all just sugar and they shouldn't be allowed. They shouldn't be fed to children. Children should get their sweets from eating fresh fruits, yeah. apples and bananas and plums and persimmons and mangoes and, they should, and oranges and apples. They should be eating real fruit because when the sugar is bound to the fiber in fruit, it's inside the cell of the fruit. It's not outside the cell wall. And as you break down the cell wall in the digestive tract, the sugar is gradually absorbed and you can preferentially burn it as energy instead of storing it as fat and spiking addictive centers and addictive centers in the brain. It's free sugar. And honey and maple syrup and apple juice is free sugar because this you've taken the fiber away, you've unbound it from the cell, and now it spikes into the bloodstream more rapidly. And that can, of course, damage the immune system and also um, affect the brain. And by the way, anytime you get a surge of calories higher than you can get through natural foods, like you could eat nuts or seeds, and you can't get that much fat into the bloodstream at one time because the fat is absorbed too slowly. But if you take the walnut oil instead of the walnut or the avocado oil instead of the avocado, you can spike the calories in the bloodstream way up and you can affect dopamine centers in the brain that, make you, that, that are calorically stimulated to make the person addicted to an excessive caloric load. These things are appetite stimulants. So we always... And, and in the modern world, most people think oil is like a health food. So most, um, most people in the modern, in the Western world, the United States and Europe, get most of their fat intake from animal fat or from oil. On a nutritarian diet that I recommend, it's not a extreme, it's not a low fat, extremely low fat diet, but we get our fat from eating whole food plants that contain fat, like walnuts and sesame seeds and almonds and pistachio nuts and olives and avocado. We use whole food to make the Thai curry sauce and to make the icing on the chocolate cake. We'll make an avocado icing and the cake will have in it, you know, carrots and beets and pineapple and cocoa powder and a few dates to sweeten it. We don't use anything, or no thing to sweeten it that's outside of the natural food where the sugar comes from something that's fiber bound. It's intracellular. The sugar is in the cell, not outside the cell. So there's a different biological effect on human tissue. Interesting, interesting. We'll have to find out your some of your uh, cake recipes, your sugar-free cake recipes. Do and I make ice cream. My favorite ice cream is just vanilla ice cream with with frozen banana, maybe a little unsweetened coconut and macadamia nut with some real vanilla bean powder. And you don't need any sweetener because the banana is good enough. And it's you don't even want it that sweet because your taste buds haven't been deadened by the high sugar diet. And it's sweet enough for us to eat an ice cream with frozen banana or frozen fruit. You know, whipped frozen mango with a little 
um, unsweetened coconut, and a little squeeze of lemon is a great like is a great type of mango sorbet. So we can make desserts, and we can make great sauces for vegetables, and we can make great breakfast meals, and big salads with a dressing with a Caesar dressing made out of hemp seeds and cashew nuts. And, um, you know, and maybe some tofu with some, a little bit of miso and kelp and nutritional yeast and a date. And we can make a delicious salad dressing that's not made of oil and salt. And, you know, or we put, we can make a, a, um, a Russian vinaigrette, maybe with some tomato sauce and some almonds and blood and some black fig vinegar. And we can make a delicious salad dressings or with tom or sesame, toasted sesame seeds and cashews with, with, um, with navel oranges and lemon and blood orange vinegar. We can make delicious salad dressings, sauces, dips, desserts without without using any sugar or oil or salt in it. Amazing. Well, I'm, I'm salivating listening to this. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Amazing, yeah. Fantastic. So so what can you, let's, let's, let's look at some actionable steps for people that are listening, because we're fascinated by what you're saying. And, and um, you know, we, we are very passionate in addition to uh, whatever products we are so, uh, uh, also providing, but also to provide high quality information for people to make really informed choices and to be educated so that, and then, you know, to help them by giving them some actionable steps. So if you were going to give some advice to people listening, what things could they start by doing today to make a difference if they really can see that their lifestyle is spiraled out of control? What could they do right now to make a difference to their, to their life? Well, lunch is the most important meal of the day. I want people to eat a hearty lunch and to include a large salad that you can't fit it in a soup bowl. It has to be a serving bowl size, a larger bowl. And the salad should have a dressing made of nuts and seeds because nuts and seeds have been shown that reduce cardiovascular deaths by about 40% when people use nuts and seeds as a source of fat. And the vegetables you're putting in the salad are some cruciferous greens, like arugula or cabbage or broccoli or kale or something, you know, not just the lettuce. But lettuce has, is the richest source of sulfoquinivos. Lettuce supports the growth of the healthy bacteria in the, in the gut. And we're green vegetable dependent animals. You know, the medical profession gives full pregnant women folic acid to prevent neural tube defects instead of getting them to eat vegetables that contain folate. It's insane. It creates, that creates breast cancer. Folic acid is dangerous. And they should, we're supposed to be getting folate from green vegetables. So a salad every day and on the weekend, the whole family gets together and makes a big bowl of vegetable bean soup in a giant pot. And then the next day, when you put that big pot in the refrigerator, you can put it into 10 different containers in the refrigerator the next day, and you can have the soup and the salad and a little and some fruit for dessert. And if everybody across the modern world ate a big salad, a bowl of vegetable bean soup and some fresh fruit dessert for lunch, we'd see, you know, a tremendous improvement in healthcare costs and in human tragedy reduction. Amazing. Yeah. That's really, a really great advice. Fantastic. Yeah. And that sounds like to me, I'm, I come from a Latin American background. That kind of sounds like the sort of food we grew up having, <laughs> sort of beans and, and pots beans and, 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 and salad and salad at every meal. every And single mushrooms meal. and onions, beans and greens and mushrooms and onions and big salad and cook. Right, right. And you put the beans in the soup with the mushrooms and the onions and you have a great tasting soup. You put vegetable juices in there and, and you can put spices and herbs in there and you can make things taste good without using making you know without cooking by frying food and using sugar and oil and salt fantastic so a lot of raw food as well yes you want that combination of raw and cooked you want the mix because don't forget your healthy microbiome has to do with the diversity of foods you're eating we want diversity of natural foods and we want foods that are rich in nutrients and um, the spectrum of nutrients, getting the full rainbow of nutrients, so looking at nutritional variety, a lot of natural plants. So I'm telling people we have this unprecedented opportunity in human history to eat a wider diversity of foods than our ancestors could have eaten. Like we can eat wild blueberries in the wintertime, and we can eat you know, steel cut oats and green leafy vegetables and sprouts all year round. We, can, we have access to foods where we have the ability to live to be 97 to 107 years old on the average. We can live past 95 years old on the average with nutritional excellence. And very few people in the modern world are taking advantage of the science that demonstrates this and utilizing the foods in the marketplace that enables us to do this. But you know, they wouldn't be selling 
you know, organic lettuce and sprouts and, you know, the, and these foods if people weren't buying them. So somebody's buying them. So there is some knowledgeable people around knowing that mushrooms and onions and green vegetables and salad and kale and things like that and arugula are really good for you or people just wouldn't be buying them at all. So some people are aware, but not everybody, you know. That's interesting. That's fantastic. Well, I think those are pretty actionable things. Are there any uh, last points you wanted to ask uh, Dr. Thurman? Um, yeah, I, no, that's well, for me, that's great. I, that's something I'm going to action straight away as with myself. Uh, it's because that's easy and doable. That's the thing yeah. that what I really like about that advice is, yeah, anybody can actually go out and do that, get a salad, get the, get involved with the nuts. They're readily available. Um, I, you know, it's things I've done with my children is, is I, I've actually cooked things like bolognese in the past where I've actually I've actually been hiding kale in there. So you can shred kale up and you chop it really small. You can kind of like stealth, uh, you know, vegetize your children by uh, adding some of these things, even chocolate, even a chocolate cake. You know, you can make a cake and put kale in it and it actually works really well. So, yeah, and you no, can make that chocolate cake with whole grain. And you can put shredded beets and shredded carrots in there, which we do. And you can put a little cocoa powder and some dates to sweeten it. And you don't need any sugar. It's plenty sweet enough with the dates and the carrots and the shredded beets and a little cocoa powder and a little bit of dates. And we use a little almond butter in there. And we make a delicious chocolate cake that's not as sweet as a regular chocolate cake, but the kids love it. Yeah. Kids love this food. Amazing, yeah. amazing. That's such great Thank advice. So and yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think we can we can all take some uh, you know sort of heed from that. So mm. stay away from the white food. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stay away from the white food. Stay away from the white powders, <laughs> and go for the whole food. Stay away from yeah. the oils. Stay away from the salt, the sugar, and go for your whole foods and your nuts. Right. Fantastic. So my latest book with all those with those recipes is called Eat for Life. Amazing. But my most best selling cookbook is called the Eat to Live Cookbook because my best selling book was Eat to Live. So the Eat to Live Cookbook is a great place. But my but Eat for Life is my most recent book with the most updated science. If people are interested in taking this further, absolutely fantastic. I mean, I, well, certainly well, post a link. One of, to... one of the things I was going to say as well. In fact, actually, um, Doctor Furman, when you actually Google your name, that your your cookbook come. That's the first thing that comes up in oh, Google really? is your cookbook. So yeah, I had a. I, I was looking at that and I was very interested to have a read. Uh, and obviously, you've got everything there. On, on so it's uh, yeah, very interesting. Certainly worth getting hold of a copy. That was, so thank you Fantastic. so much. Fantastic. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll certainly provide. Yeah. We'll provide a link to 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 um uh, you know to your web page so that people can take a, take heed and take some more of this fantastic high quality and evidence-based information that you're providing us and uh, we're so grateful to have had you on Sugar Free TV. Thank you. Best of health to you guys, of course, all your listeners. Thank, Thank you, you so, so, so much. Brilliant. Thank you. So I'm going to stop recording now <laughs> and say thank you so, so much. So you can stop recording, Luke. Uh, one second. So if you just go to the button in the middle, it should say stop recording. Thank you so much.